We have been talking for the last couple of weeks about how Jesus used stories when he talked to people a lot of times. And what he did was he would tell stories and use them as teaching tools. Um, They were known as parables. And let's see, we've got a brand new computer back there and we'll see if it's working. Parable, yes. And what a parable is, a parable is a fictional, fictional earthly story that is used to demonstrate a heavenly or spiritual principle. So when we're dealing with parables, that means it's not a literal or a factual story. A lot of times we church folks know that the Bible is true, so we think that everything in it is a historical or a philosophical or a scientific fact. And that's not the way it was written. That's not what it's for. Um, This is a fictional earthly story used to demonstrate a heavenly or spiritual principle. And we've been talking specifically about something called the parable of the sower in the Bible. Now, sometimes I got to remind people that it's the text of the Bible that is inspired by the Holy Spirit, not the helper things that we put in. And there is no title of this story in the Bible the way it was originally written. We put that in there so we'd know where to find stuff. Did you know that there are no verse numbers in the Bible? Those were put in there to help us find stuff. There are no chapter numbers in the Bible. So that is not the inspired text. This is called the parable of the sower, but we decided that it really should be called the parable of the four soils because that's what it is focused on. And Jesus told this story in Matthew chapter 13. It's also in the book of Mark. It's also in the book of Luke. Jesus said he told many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds. He scattered them across his field. Some seeds fell on a footpath. The birds came and ate them. Other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock, and the seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plants soon wilted under the hot sun. Since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Other seeds fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, even a hundred times as much as had been planted. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Now, we also need to remember that Jesus didn't tell parables so that everyone would know exactly what he was talking about. We're not going to go through it again today, but he told parables so that people could listen, people could relate, but people who really were paying attention, people who really were looking at what he was doing and listening to what he was saying, would realize that there were much deeper meanings in what he told us. The parable of the soils told us about four types of soil. Jesus explains in Matthew chapter 13 and starting in verse 18, it says, now listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message about the kingdom and don't understand it. Then the evil one comes and snatches away the seed that was planted in their hearts. Do you know that God plants seeds in people's hearts and they don't get it? Do you know that at some point in time in each one of our lives, that was us? I'm hoping it's not now. But God is always doing things. If you ever find yourself in a position to where, why has God abandoned us? God has not abandoned anybody. We just don't get what he's doing. And the seeds that he is planting can be taken away. 
the shallow soil. Jesus said, <clears throat> the seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. Yay! God wants you to be healthy. Yay! God wants you to prosper. Yay! If you follow God, everything in your life from that moment on will be perfect. Uh, no. That's nowhere in the Bible. They immediately receive it with joy, but since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. Sometimes we hear stuff and we really like it. But it requires things of us we're not willing to give. And we're a little shallow and it goes away. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. The thorny soil. Jesus says it represents the seed that fell among the thorns are those who hear God's word, but all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth, so no fruit is produced. Sometimes we receive the seed of God's word, but we're so distracted by the things going on around us. We're so focused on our goals and accomplishing what we want to accomplish that the seed that God gives us doesn't produce any fruit because we're not supposed to be focused on the world we live in. We're not supposed to be focused on the things going on around us. We're not supposed to be focused on what we want. We're supposed to be focused on him. So finally, he gets to good fertile soil. And he says the seed that fell on good soil represents those who truly hear and understand God's word. You know that hearing and understanding are two different things? I sat in four years of Spanish classes in school. And I heard every word that was said. And at the end of four years of Spanish, I can almost ask where the bathroom is. I can assume that I won't understand the answer because my head just didn't work that way. I am still to this day so impressed with people that can speak multiple languages because my head doesn't do that. I heard it, but I didn't understand it. When we hear God's word and we understand God's word, Jesus says when we do that, we can get a harvest of 30, 60, even 100 times as much as had been planted. Can you imagine having your life produce 30 times what God has planted in it? Well, what about 60 times? What about 100 times what God has planted in your life? your life produces. So what we found out was that the soil is the area where we can impact things. We can't make God a more effective spreader. A lot of times I want to give God advice on how to do things better. For some reason, he's not that interested. We can't make God better at being God. We can't improve the seed that he's sowing. You and I cannot improve his word. The only area where you and I can really get involved to make a difference is on the condition of the soil, which we saw represents our heart. In Hebrews chapter four, it said God's word is alive and working and is sharper than a double-edged sword. It cuts all the way into us where the soul and the spirit are joined to the center of our joints and bones. It judges the thoughts and feelings in our hearts. Our hearts 
are where our soil exists. Can our hearts be hard packed? Yes. Can our hearts be shallow? Yes. Can our hearts be overwhelmed with thorns? Yes. Can our hearts be good, fertile soil? Yes. That part is up to us. So, what we want to have, we want to have eyes to see. Folks, that's up to us. Well, I just don't see what God's doing. It's not the fault of God in what he's doing. That's what we look at. We want to have ears to hear. Well, I don't hear anything from God. Doesn't mean he's not speaking. We have to have ears to hear. And we need a heart to understand. Have you ever not understood what somebody is doing? Of course you have. I've told you before that at my house growing up, it was my mom and my dad and my brothers and me. It was a bunch of guys and mom trying to control us. I had no idea how women worked. They made no sense to me. Wait, you mean you say something to them and they cry? I thought they'd just punch. That's what we do. Well, see, we have to learn to understand sometimes. And one of the most effective ways to do that is simply to ask. I've got no problem saying, God, I'm not sure what you're doing here. Can you help me out? And the book of James says that whenever we lack wisdom, we can ask God for it. He loves to help us understand things. My daughters had either the fortune or the misfortune, depending on what kind of mood they're in, of growing up with a dad who was a teacher. They learned to be very careful when they asked questions about how things worked. Because I'll explain it. When I say, when you load the dishwasher, you do it this way. And if they said, why? I'll tell you. I'll explain it to you. I figured out years after we had been dating that Rhonda figured out how to deal with my moods or my irritations and stuff. And when I was really annoyed at something and I was complaining about something, she would ask me a question about how a car worked. (laughs) And I'd be annoyed at somebody and I'd be complaining about him and we'd be on the freeway and she'd see something that said twin cam. And she'd go, what's twin cam mean? And I would go, oh, well, that's the way the timing works and the valves open. And and I'd explain the whole thing to her because I explain things. It's what I do. God likes to explain things. So we want to have eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand. In other words, we want fertile soil. What is fertile soil? Eyes to see, ears to hear, and a heart to understand. That's what we want. I'm starting to figure out that that's the most important thing that I can look for. Having fertile soil is something that I need to make a priority in my life. Now, a lot of times we like the fertile soil idea because it makes us look spiritual. We like to look spiritual, especially on Sunday morning at church. We like when people around us think, oh, 
they're really on the right track. I see, I grew up at church. I know what the rules are at church. When I was a kid, you dressed up. It's a phrase we don't hear much anymore, but you had Sunday clothes. And if you wore your Sunday clothes on the other days of the week, (laughs) you were in trouble because those were your Sunday clothes. And when you got to church, it does not matter what was going on at home. It does not matter what was going on in the car. It doesn't matter what was going on in the parking lot. Shut up and smile. (laughs) You may be ripping each other's eyes out in the car. But when you get out of the car at church, you look like you're at church because we like to look spiritual. That's been going on as long as there have been people. We like to look good. We're not so concerned with whether or not we are good, but we like to look good. Jesus dealt with this when he was walking around And he wasn't particularly fooled. He said, those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. So if I'm the type of person that likes to walk around and make everybody think I know it all, I'm going to be humbled. Last week we talked about how much it hurts to be humbled. But if you're the type of person that can walk around being real and not lifting yourself up, you are the type of person that God will exalt. It's always better to be good than to look good. Peter talked about this in his first letter in 1 Peter 5. Peter says, humble yourselves under the mighty power of God and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Honor only matters based on who's giving it. If I give somebody an award for best sushi, (laughs) it is worthless. Because the closest I've ever come to sushi was when I was baiting the hook when I went fishing. (laughs) I know nothing about sushi. And much to my children's chagrin, I don't care to know anything about sushi. To me, it's just not natural. (laughs) Now, we people are weird about food. I was reading about a lady who went into a restaurant and the restaurant had their own deli. And she says, well, what's your special today? And the guy said, oh, we've got a special on grilled cow tongue. (laughs) Said, it is amazingly good. I really recommend it. And she said, oh, I could never eat anything that had been inside a cow's mouth. And the waiter said, okay, what can I get you? And she said, how about a couple of eggs? (laughs) Do I have to explain this? (laughs) Something in a cow's mouth is not acceptable, but something up a chicken's butt is okay? (laughs) You see, if I give an honor about a food that I don't, eat. It's not worth anything. If I tell you the steak you made for me is very good, pay attention because I like steak and I'm good at cooking it. 
Rhonda did a very smart thing when we started dating. She started dating a guy who was a cook at Marie Callender's. Now see, when God lifts you up in honor, you, my friend, have been honored. But that only happens when we humble ourselves. Then last week, we also talked about what happens when we think we blow it. We want God to use us, but we do something stupid. There's something in our past that is bad, or there's something in our past that is not honorable, or there's something in our past that is embarrassing. And last week, we entitled that stuff, Spiritual Manure. And we had more talk about poop last week than probably any sermon any of us have ever heard. (laughs) But we also looked and we noticed that what God is able to do with our spiritual manure and the soil that is our hearts. And it's the very thing that can make us fertile, ready to receive and ready to bear fruit. Paul writes in Romans 8, 28, it was already referenced in the service today. God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose for them. The things in our lives that we think are bad, he did not do. But if we surrender them to him, he can work with them. And he can use them to bring about good. God didn't do it. But if we're willing to give it to him, he can bring good out of it. So, that is our review. (laughs) You still may be feeling a little less than confident that God can use us to spread his word to the people around us. Let's read what the prophet Isaiah had to say. In Isaiah chapter 55, he says, the rain and snow come down from the heavens and they stay on the ground to water the earth. They cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. Notice we're talking about seed and soil and producing things with it. It is the same with my word, God says. I send it out. Now please read this carefully. I send out my word and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish what I want it to. And it will prosper everywhere I send it. We're going to read that again. It is the same with my word. I send it out and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to and it will prosper everywhere I send it. The problem is not God's word. When God sends out his word, it always produces fruit. The question for me is, do I want it to produce fruit through me? When God sends his word out, it accomplishes what God wants it to. The question is, do I want it to accomplish what God wants through me? When God sends his word out, it prospers everywhere he sends it. The question is, do I want to prosper when God sends his word. You will live in joy and peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song. The trees of the field will clap their hands. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But I can also see a children's cartoon. And I can see mountains and hills bursting into song. 
I can see trees so happy they're clapping. And it's silly, but it's a great visual. How powerful is the word of God? It can change the nature of the world around us. Because I've lived in Riverside a long time. I have yet to hear Mount Rubidoux burst into song. (laughs) Yeah, I've seen it burst into flames every 4th of July. (laughs) That was funny when we moved into our house up off Canyon Ridge 17 plus years ago. Jeff Moss and I were standing out on our deck and we were looking around the valley in Riverside. And one of us said, huh, I wonder which one of those hills is Mount Rubidoux. And we were looking. And Jeff said, do you suppose it's the one with the big cross on the top of it? (laughs) Yeah, I guess that's probably it. God's word can change the nature of the world around us. The trees of the field will clap their hands. (laughs) And Isaiah wraps things up. And he says, where once there were thorns, cypress trees will grow. Thorns, you mean like the stresses and the worries of this world? that can choke out what God is trying to do if we let it? Where once there were thorns, cypress trees will grow. Where nettles grew, myrtles will sprout up. These events will bring great honor to the Lord's name. They will be an everlasting sign of his power and love. And I don't have a clue what nettles and myrtles are. So instead of going by and going, I don't know what that means, I looked them up. A myrtle. It's an evergreen shrub. It has shiny leaves, white or pink flowers and blackberries. They are very attractive. They are pleasant and they smell good. Nettles. Well, there are six subspecies. Five of them have hollow stinging hairs called trichomes on the leaves and stems, which act like small hypodermic needles, injecting histamine and other chemicals that produce a stinging sensation upon contact. Where nettles grew, myrtles will sprout up. That junk in your lives that drive you crazy? Evergreen, flowering, pleasant smelling shrubs can take their place if we allow the word of God to be planted in fertile soil. Now I found out that the word nettle isn't just describing a plant. There was a list of synonyms, which are words that mean the same thing as nettle, but they use different words. I'm going to go over a couple of them. Got to take a breath. Irritated, annoyed, crossed, put out, irked, galled, vexed, exasperated, infuriated, upset, displeased, offended, affronted, disgruntled, peaked, aggrieved, stung, huffy in a huff, peeved, aggravated, miffed, miffy, riled, hacked off, peed off. Oh, I didn't see that one yesterday when I was putting this together. Otherwise, I wouldn't have read it. (laughs) Cheesed off. Browned off. Brassed off. Narked. Eggy. Not best pleased. Teed off. Ticked off. Sore. Vexed. Snuffy. Irritated. Annoying. Irked. Galled. Angered. Exasperated. Infuriated. Bothered. Provoked. Displeased. Offended. Affronted. Get. Put someone's back up. Disgruntle. Rankle with peak again, needle, ruffle, get on someone's nerves, 
Try someone's patience, ruffle someone's feathers, make someone's hackles rise, (laughs) chafe, rub the wrong way, rankle, ride, gavel, peeve, aggravate, miff, rile, get, get to bug, get under someone's skin, get in someone's hair, get up somebody's nose, hack off, (laughs) get someone's goat, Drive up the wall, narc, get on someone's wick, give someone the hump, wind up, get across someone, tick off, rark, exacerbate, hump, and rasp. We as people have put a lot of thought into what a nettle makes you feel like. Now the funny thing is, When I read that, it made me think of Facebook. (laughs) It made me think of the news. It made me think of political talk radio. It made me think of our entire culture and how it compared to what the Bible talks about nettles being. And it occurred to me that I can't do anything to stop any of this except let myrtles grow in their place. And whose choice is that? That's my choice based on whether or not I allow God's word to be planted in fertile soil. The thorny soil is where we focus on this stuff not God's word. God seeds, his words, will replace in our world this stuff when we allow God to plant it in fertile soil in our hearts. If we're walking around feeling like that. Gosh, I want to make sure I say this right. It's not the world's fault. We're the ones in charge of our soil. You know, there are people that walk around feeling just like that who look amazing Sometimes we focus on what we look like and we ignore what's going on in our heart. Now, I know this sounds pretty drastic. I know this sounds a little unbelievable. God couldn't really use me to change things, could he? Well, look at what the Apostle Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 3. Paul, who as we discussed last week, had plenty of spiritual manure in his past. Remember, he was a Pharisee who helped orchestrate the murder of Christians. He says, though I am the least deserving of all God's people. Have you noticed how rarely People in our culture talk about being the least deserving. All we focus on is what our rights are. The Apostle Paul, the guy who wrote two thirds of the New Testament says, I'm the least deserving of all God's people. He graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning, reminding us that God had this plan from the beginning. God's purpose in all of this was to give the church, to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety 
to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Well, we're just under spiritual oppression. Paul says God's plan is to use the church to show his wisdom to the rulers in heavenly places. God's plan is to use you to show his wisdom. It's amazing how quiet it can get in here. (laughs) This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because of Christ and our faith in him, we can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. Um, God, are you busy? You know what I think's funny? My kids almost never say, hey dad, you busy? When I answer the phone, a lot of times I don't get to talk for the next three minutes or so. Because <laughs> they know that there are almost no things around who are more important to me than what they have to say. Now, I am not eternal. Do you know that God can focus on you exclusively for all of eternity and not neglect anyone else? It is not possible for you to waste God's time. We can come boldly and confidently into God's presence. Please don't lose heart because of my trials here. Trials? Yes, Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians while he was in jail, getting ready to be put to death. If you understand the things Paul was dealing with as he's talking about having joy in all situations. I have a problem having joy when I walk down the soda aisle at the grocery store and they don't have the flavor I'm looking for. I don't get it. There's a virus, so I can't get Cherry Coke Zero? Or even worse, Diet Dr. Pepper? Gosh. Paul's writing letters like this from prison. And not prison because he did something immoral. Prison because he was speaking about the gospel. Don't lose heart because of my trials here. I'm suffering for you. So you should feel honored. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and earth. when I'm in prison for preaching the gospel and I think about what it's like that I get to preach the gospel. I fall to my knees and pray to the Father giving thanks that he's allowed me to do this. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources he will empower Paul's the one in jail and he's praying that God empowers other people? Paul's the one in dire need and he's praying that God's blessing and provision will go to the people he's talking to. (laughs) 
but God's glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. Not shallow soil. Deep, fertile soil. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it's too great to understand fully. Oh, when will I ever fully understand how God loves us? You never will. God is infinite. We are not. You know that when we get to heaven, we can spend all eternity learning about how God loves us and we still won't get it. It's too great to understand fully. But then you'll be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. I may never understand it fully, but I sure want to see how much I can get. Now all glory to God who's able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. infinitely more than we might ask or think. Do you suppose that might be 30 times? 60 times? A hundred times more than he's planted? Here's the problem with numbers. If I can conceive of a hundred times, I can conceive of 101. Paul said infinitely. Are we interested in the seed that God plants in our hearts doing more than we can even conceive or imagine? You remember when Jesus said that ridiculous thing about my followers would do even greater works than me? Do you suppose he meant it? Paul wraps it up and says, glory to him in the church and the Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Paul seems to understand and want us to understand what allowing our hearts to be good soil to receive the seed of the word of God means. We can't improve God. We can't improve God's word. But we can do what it takes to keep our hearts fertile and ready to receive. We can forget about trying to look good. And we can instead focus on what our private relationship with him is like. We can forget about trying to keep track of what other people are doing. Well, I just don't know how much they pray. How many chapters a week do they read of the scripture? Do they use the correct version of the Bible? Do they watch enough Christian TV? I hate to say it, but if that's the standard, I'm in trouble. (laughs) If we surrender to God, if we focus on keeping our hearts, our soil fertile, 
and ready for his word to take root. If we pay attention to our relationship with him and let him bring good things through us, God will reach the people who need him through us. And he will do infinitely more than we can conceive of. But it's a matter of our soil. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you, Father, for patiently helping us learn that it is our relationship with you. It is our heart that determines what you are able to do. We're the ones who choose what kind of soil we are. And Father, I am so happy that my family here at Bethel wants to be good, fertile soil. My family here at Bethel wants to be the kind of soil that you can plant seed in and that plant will bring a 30, 60, even a hundredfold return on what you planted. We want to be the ones that you use to reach the people around us. So Father, as we continue to go through this weird time, we know that you are with us. Your spirit is walking with us every step and we can trust you. We can focus on you. We can quit trying to look good to the people around us. We can focus on our relationship with you. And I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen.